بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ما بعد قال الله تعالى هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون صدق الله العظيم الحمد لله I think everyone's had their lunch now I remember when I was eating lunch I told the brothers that I can't have too much biryani because when you eat too much biryani, you get something called the death burp. Does anyone know the death burp? If you don't know the death burp, you'll experience it in taraweeh very soon. Yeah? The death burp is when someone eats too much and then they burp and then it's, mashallah, everyone smells the sweet fragrance. Mashallah. But khair, so inshallah you've all enjoyed your lunch, inshallah. Welcome back. Um, my topic today is uh, knowledge. My brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Qur'an, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَرِيفًا And when your Lord, when your Rabb, He said to the angels, I am going to make on the earth a representative, a khalifa. What does the khalifa do? What does the representative do? You send a representative somewhere to do what? To fulfill your commands. And so I'm sending on this earth someone who will fulfill my commandments. Someone who will avoid my prohibitions. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He sent Adam alayhi salam and then through him his progeny and then he continued to send different prophets. And these prophets, their duty was to remind the people. It was to remind the people and to teach them. لِيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابِ لِيُعَلِّمَهُمُ الْكِتَابِ that the, that the prophets can teach the people. But then as we all know, the last prophet was our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say it again. Whenever the prophet's name is mentioned, you have to say sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so after his death, the duty of relaying the message. The duty of this sacred knowledge, it fell upon whose shoulders? It fell upon the shoulders of the Ummah, the nation of the Prophet ﷺ. But this duty, my brothers and sisters, this duty requires education. It requires knowledge. And in this society and in this dunya, education is given a great place. Education gets you places. Education increases your status. Education can help you earn your living. But the knowledge I am talking about is not the knowledge of the dunya. It is the knowledge of Islam. It is the knowledge of the akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ That are those who know equal to those who have no knowledge? Are those who have ilm, those who have the knowledge of the deen, are they equal to those who have no knowledge? Of course not. Of course not. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says ilm, which can be loosely translated as knowledge, He does not mean just any knowledge, but He means the knowledge of Islam and the knowledge of the deen. The first words to be revealed, we all know it. The name of my masjid that I am an imam of, it's also Iqra, the first word to be revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. Iqra, read, Bismi Rabbika alladhi khalaq, in the name of your Lord. In the name of your Lord who created you. And unfortunately, many of us, we know, mashallah, how to get from the sun and back. We know so much science. We know so much, uh, whatever else you study in school, maths, physics, all of these things. We know so many things. But when it comes to simple things in our religion, our knowledge is lacking. When it comes from simple things like making wudu, to praying your salah, people are doubtful, have I done my salah properly? Have I done my wudu properly? And the list goes on and on. It's important that we seek this knowledge. It's important that we obtain this knowledge. The Prophet ﷺ, he said in a hadith, narrated by Imam Muslim, طلب العلم فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ وَمُسْلِمًا That the seeking of knowledge 
is a responsibility, it's a fard, it's an obligation upon every Muslim and Muslimah, every male and female Muslim. And so what does it mean when the Prophet ﷺ, he said that the knowledge is an obligation? Does it mean all knowledge? Or does it mean the knowledge that is required for everyone? So when someone has enough money that he needs to pay zakah, now he needs, it has become an obligation for him to learn how much zakah he needs to pay. It has become an obligation for him to learn who he needs to pay his zakah to. And this is the understanding of the scholars of this hadith. Similarly, there is a fard kifaya. Do we all know what fard kifaya is? Fard kifaya means communal obligation. Communal obligation. And what that means is that if there is a community and someone dies in the community, then it is a fard kifaya, a communal obligation that the community, someone in the community has to wash the body and has to pray on the dead body and bury him or her. And that is a fard kifaya. If no one in the community does it, then what happens? They are all sinful. And similarly with knowledge. If a community exists, if there is a community, and there is no one of knowledge in that community, then it has become an obligation upon each and every single person that somewhat they need to help someone from their community go and learn the deen so that that person can come back and teach them. It becomes a fard kifaya, it becomes an obligation. And if no one in that community goes out, if no one in that community seeks that knowledge, then what happens? What happens? Can someone tell me? Yes, brother? Everyone is sinful. He's understood, so you've all understood, inshallah. Or maybe some of you haven't understood. Yeah, so you have, it's, it's a sin, the sin is upon everyone. And so it's very important to understand this, my brothers and sisters. And so many of us in our communities, we hear people complaining. Complaining about the Imams. Complaining about these Mulwis. They're no good. They always talk in different languages. We don't understand them, etc., etc. But we haven't actually done our part to fulfill the communal obligation on the community to make sure that someone is going from the community, that someone is going and seeking that knowledge, or a group of people are going and seeking that knowledge. It's very important. In the past, in the past, the brightest minds went to seek knowledge. The brightest minds. Nowadays, a man has three sons, he might say, two sons, one of them can become a doctor, one of them can become an engineer, and you over here, you're not too bright, let's send you to the madrasa, let's make you a scholar. And then, then afterward we complain, afterward we complain, why do our ulama not understand, why do our ulama, why are, why do, why are they not relevant? But in fact, it is us that are responsible for this. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ, he meant when he said, That the seeking of knowledge is an obligation on every Muslim and Muslimah. If we look in the past, we find the likes of Imam al-Shafi'i. Everyone's heard of Imam al-Shafi'i, the great alim, the great Imam. He was so bright when he was a young boy. He was a student of Imam Malik rahimahullah. He was a student of Imam Malik rahimahullah. And Imam Malik, it took him 40 years to collect hadith and gather them in his book Al-Muwatta. And Imam Malik lived in Medina. He was the Mufti of Medina. It took him 40 years to gather his book. Imam al-Shafi'i was his student. In 17 days, he came back to Imam Malik and he said, I'm done. Imam Malik said, what do you mean you're done? He said, I've memorized the whole thing in 17 days. Thousands of hadith. This was the brightest of minds that were engaged in the seeking of knowledge. Imam al-Shafri was such, he was such, that when he would read a book, he would have to cover one page. Why? Because 
His memory was so sharp that he would, his, uh, he would get confused. He would get mixed up in his mind that which page is, is the photo of basically. Which page has he taken a photo of? Uh, because he had photo, uh, photographic memory, mashallah. And that, those are the likes of the people that, that sought the sacred knowledge. But <clears throat> the sacred knowledge is not easy. It requires a struggle. It does not only require a clever mind, but it requires a struggle. And if we look at the ulama, if we look at the scholars, not only in the past, but even today, we realize how much they struggle to preserve this knowledge and to spread it. One of the greatest Imams, Imam al nawawi Imam al nawawi whose book, Riyadh al-Salihin, you find in every masjid. Riyadh al-Salihin, you find it in every masjid. And he has a great explanation of the hadith of Imam Muslim or the hadith collection of Imam Muslim. And so Imam al nawawi how did he used to study? Some of you or many of you might have already studied your A-levels or you're studying your A-levels now. Some people, they do how many A-levels? Three? Four? And they'll say, I've done enough now. You can take it to be that Imam Nawawi, he did the equivalent of 12 A-levels. Every day he would attend 12 classes of the highest level of sciences from a young age when he lived in uh, his village. And then, when he became 19, he asked his father, he said, Oh father, I want to travel to Damascus, to Dimashq. I want to go to Damascus, to Damascus, and I want to seek with the greatest of scholars over there. So his father allowed him and funded him to go. And when he went to Damascus, how did he live? Imam al nawawi for two years, for two years, Imam al says, I did not put my back on the floor. Meaning when he would sleep, he would sleep on his desk. He would sleep on his desk, he would wake up. He said, I did not sleep on my side, I did not sleep on my back for two years, and this was his struggle. Someone brought him an orange. Someone brought him an orange and said, Imam, no, we have this nice fruit. Yeah? It wasn't like now you go to the shop and you buy, mashallah, kilos and kilos of oranges. It was a delicacy. Someone brought it to him. And he said, no, I can't have it because it will make me feel sleepy. I will not be able to study. If we find, if we look elsewhere, we find the likes of Ibn Rushd, Rahimahullah, Ibn Rushd lived in Spain. He lived in Andalus. He was not only a great scholar. He did not only write one of the greatest books in comparative fiqh, but he was also a doctor. And his books in medicine were used in the, in the West for many years. On top of this, on top of this, he was also a philosopher. And it was through him that the West preserved the works of Aristotle. Through Ibn Rushd, subhanAllah. And it is through him that they attribute a part of the, the Renaissance of Europe. Through him, through the works of Aristotle, which they received through Ibn Rushd. And so these scholars, they struggled. Ibn Rushd, it is said, or he said himself, that Every night he would study, he would spend the entire night studying except for two nights when his father died and when he got married. Other than that, every single night he spent studying. And that is how he reached that level. That is how he reached that level. And there's so many examples. I had so many examples prepared. But uh, I, don't, I think we're going to run short on time if I go through all of them. I'll give you one more. I'll give you one more, or maybe two more. Imam al-Sarukhasi, rahimahullah, a great Hanafi scholar. He was imprisoned. Many of these scholars, they went through trouble with the governments because the governments didn't agree with what they were saying or because they wanted to speak the truth and the government didn't agree with it. And so he was punished. He was imprisoned in a very peculiar punishment. He was put in a well. That was a punishment in, some of, in those times that he was put into a well. But that did not stop him. That did not stop him. Imam al Qasi, here's the death bird, brothers. We have to watch out for the death bird. But uh, Imam al Qasi, Imam al Qasi, he was in the well. His students came to him outside the well and he dictated to them a book. 
not 20 pages, not 30 pages. If you can find this book today, Al Mabsut. Al Mabsut means vast. This book, you can find it in nine volumes. It was dictated from where? From the well. From the bottom of a well. His students had come around and wrote down what he was saying. From memory. Subhanallah. But even today you find, mashallah, scholars who are going out, they are seeking the knowledge. They are seeking the knowledge and it is our duty that we accompany them. It is our duty that we learn from them and that we take advantage of their knowledge. Because the Prophet wasallam he has told us that knowledge leaves this world through what? Through the dying of scholars. When scholars die, then men, much knowledge is lost. Much knowledge is not lost. Much of the understandings that we have is lost, that we can no longer reclaim. And so we have to take advantage of these scholars while they are alive, and we have to accompany them. But that does not mean, I'm not saying that everyone needs to become a shaykh. Everyone needs to become an allama. Everyone needs to become an imam. That is not what the Quran and Sunnah ask us. But whatever we study, whatever we educate ourselves in, whatever qualifications we get from university and college, we have to put these to use, my brothers and sisters. We have to put these to use in aid of this ummah. Because we are in need of these qualifications. We are in need for, of people who will come and contribute to the ummah. But it's not possible if we don't stand up and say it will be I who will do it. We cannot wait for others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم Allah says that Allah does not change a people. Allah does not change a people until they change themselves. So if we do not change ourselves, if we do not stand up and say, no, I will take responsibility. Just like our brother Kamal, he was standing up here. He said, I'm going to take responsibility to respond to this video. Similarly, when something comes up, and some work needs being done, then you have to stand up and you have to say, I will take care of this. And that brings me to my next point. Everywhere in the Quran we see a phrase, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Surely those who believe and do. Those who believe, belief is not enough, but rather those who believe وَعَمِلُوا And they did amal, they did action, they did something with their iman. الصالحات, and they did the right deed, the righteous deeds, the good deeds. كانت لهم جنات الفردوس نزلا. For them will be the gardens of paradise. For them will be the highest tiers of paradise in Firdaus. Why? Because they believed and they acted upon the belief. But what about the person who has knowledge but does not act upon that knowledge? Allah subhanahu wa taala He says in the Quran. That they are like kahimarin yahmilu asfara. They are like a donkey who is carrying books. Like a donkey that is carrying books, what does that mean? Can a donkey make use of those books? Can a donkey make use of those books that are on his back? No, rather he is only doing what? He is carrying them. He is carrying them. We cannot just carry the knowledge. We have to act upon that knowledge. We cannot be like the Quran says, like this donkey. Rather we have to be amongst those as-salihin, those righteous people that not only believe, but they also do righteous deeds. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to do those deeds. I mean. And so what are some takeaways? I'll end my talk with some action points. Some action points. The first thing is that we need to make a connection with the scholarship in our area. The first thing that we need to do is to do what? Is to seek the scholars. Seek the scholars and on a consistent basis establish a connection with them. Establish a connection with them. And I don't mean these one weekend seminars, these two weekend seminars. That is not a relationship. That is a quick course. And I'm not saying it's bad, those are great courses. But what's more important is that there is a relationship between you 
And someone, if there are no scholars, then at least go to someone who is more knowledgeable than you and sit with them and spend time with them. If you have questions, then ask them. Then ask them the questions that you have. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. And make that connection and establish that connection. It's very important. And so start with the basics. Learn about your wudu properly, your salah properly. Learn your ibadat properly. Build your foundation strong and then move on to the other things and increase your knowledge and continue to increase your knowledge from the cradle to the grave. From the minute you are born to the day you die, you should always be seeking knowledge. You should always be wanting to do more. It's a great saying of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the Imam of the Hanbali Madhab. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was working one day, he had become very old, he had become very old. And his son Abdul Rahman came to him. And his son Abdul Rahman came to him and said, O oh father, Ya Abati, O oh my beloved father, when will you take rest? When will you take rest? O oh, beloved father, you are old. You should be retired like everyone else. You should take rest now. You are old, your bones are weak. You need rest. And Imam Ahmad, what did he say? Did he say, you're right son? Did he say, now is the time for rest? No, he said, I will not rest. His whole life he has been working. He has been teaching. He has been studying. He has been persecuted. He has been put under house arrest. But he continues to struggle. He continues to struggle in the way of knowledge. And he said, I will not rest. Subhanallah, listen to these words. I will not rest until my first foot is in Jannah. And then I will rest. And then I will rest. A lot of times when we are doing work, when we are studying, even when we are just studying something as simple as Arabic, or some people might say as complex as Arabic, if we are studying something, we find it challenging. We are trying to do some youth work, we find it challenging. But my brothers, this is Jannah. This is not Jannah, sorry. This is not Jannah. There will be challenges. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, in one of my favorite verses, أَمْ حَسِبْتُمْ أَن تَدْخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ وَلَمَّا يَعْلَمِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا مِنْكُمْ وَيَعْلَمَ الصَّابِرِينَ That did you think? Did you think you will enter Jannah? Did you think you will enter Jannah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not proven whether you truly believe or not? Did you think it will be so easy that you can say Amantu Billahi and you will enter Jannah? That is not how it works. There has to be a struggle. There has to be challenges. And you have to overcome those challenges. And if you fall, you have to get right back up and try again. And you cannot stop. And you can never cease. Just like Imam Ahmad who said that I will not stop until my foot is in Jannah. And similarly, we should make that our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, قُلْ say, إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَا وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah says in the Quran, that say, that indeed, my prayers, my worship, وَمَحْيَايَا and my life, وَمَمَاتِي and my death, لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ are all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything I do is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until that moment when my foot is in Jannah, when I have placed my foot into Jannah, once I am from the successful people, once I have realized I am from the people of the right and not the people of the left. If someone takes an exam, if it's his final exam, and from this exam you will realize whether he is successful or whether he has failed, he will study as much as he can. He will prepare as much as he can. And then he will await the result. And he will be nervous about the result. And similarly, this life is a test. Not only this, but it is only one chance that we have. It is only one chance that we have to seek knowledge. It is only one chance that we have to use our skills in this, for the sake of this ummah. Because on the day of judgment, my brothers and sisters, on the day of judgment, on the Day of Judgment, everyone will be asked according to their ability. 
everyone will be asked according to their talent. If someone's ability is up here, then he will be asked accordingly. If someone's ability is down here, then he will be asked accordingly. But if someone is up here and looks below him and says, well, he's not doing anything, neither should I. But he is not going to be tested the same. He is not going to be asked in the same way. Why? Because his ability is up here. He had this ability and he is aiming down here. Rather, if our ability is here, we should aim here. That is how it should be. But unfortunately, we are the opposite. The scholars, they say that in the dunya, you should look at people below you. When it comes to dunya, we matters, you should look at people below you and say, Subhanallah, look at how much Allah has given me. I am blessed and you should thank Allah. And when it comes to the, when it comes to the deen, you look at those above you. Who has more knowledge than me? Who is more righteous than me? How can I mirror them? How can I become like them? But unfortunately, we have done the opposite. My brother has an S4, I have to get one too. My brother has a Ferrari, I have to get a Lamborghini. And when it comes to deen, at least I've memorized some hadith, he's memorized nothing. That's what some people say. At least I've memorized some Quran, at least I know 10 surahs. This guy knows two. But brother, you had so much time that you wasted, that you could have memorized so much more, that you could have learned so much more, that you could have understood so much more but you have wasted this time. And so you will be asked about this on the Day of Judgment. All your time will be asked about how did you spend your time? How did you spend your time? How did you spend this life? Because my brothers and sisters, there's only one chance. We're not going to be given another chance. On the Day of Judgment, there will be those who say, Rabbi Rji'oon, Rabbi Rji'oon. Oh Lord, return me. Return me for one day. Return me for a week. Return me for a few minutes. I will change everything. But will they be given that chance? Of course not. They will not be given that chance. And so I want everyone now to close their eyes. Close their eyes. And imagine, and imagine that on the day of judgment, on that day when everyone is lined up for their judgment, imagine what will happen when you come to the Prophet وسلم, when he is at his fountain of Al Kawthar, he is at his fountain of Al Kawthar, where everyone is going to be drinking from, where everyone will beat him for the first time. And when he asks us, What have you done for my Ummah? What have you done for my Ummah? What have you done for yourself even? What have you done for your family? Then what will be our response? What will we answer to the one that we love? What will we answer to the one that we believe in so dearly, our beloved Prophet ﷺ? And more importantly, how will we answer Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the ability to seek knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He increases our knowledge. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for knowledge that benefits us and that He keeps us away from knowledge that does not benefit us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to guide our families, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us with our work, with our activities in the masajid and in the centers. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our deeds and to forgive our sins. Ameen. Jazakumullah khair wa akhiru da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.